Today's class is on the Shrangama Sutra, and uh, the next class of the Shrangama Sutra will be on October seventh and October eighth. Is that right? I think so. And in between those classes, we'll have uh, two open classes. Uh, that is at the beginning of October, and uh, we'll make announcement then. One thing I would like to make an announcement uh, before the actual class is that, in fact, I've uh, built a library at my hometown for the schools. In the in the monastery, I've uh, built two libraries. So one is already in use, is already uh, starting uh, to operate, and the other one it will take a little time to operate. And uh, at my hometown, I built another library. I have. Uh, I have uh, provided address online so that you can then uh, send the books, so that you can send your books to the library. But when I ask you to make donations, I ask you not to donate the kind of books that you don't want. You should then hold the kind of heart of making offering, just as how it is said how it is uh, stated in the words of my perfect teacher that it is the best not to make offering of the things that you don't want. And the books that um, uh, I think would be the most useful to be displayed and to be used in the library are the uh, religious and uh, philosophical psychology and student books and uh, uh, picture illustration books for children. Also, uh, I am asking for different kinds of languages as well, not only in Chinese. In fact, I think Library is also a good place for uh, refuge, for the refuge of uh, the three jewels, um, especially without any detrimental disasters of the four elements, and then I think a library could live for a long period of time, such as in European countries, there are libraries that would last for hundreds of years. Therefore, I feel it is quite important to build a library to also collect books. I myself also donated my books, the books that I cherish. Because I never know when impermanence will down to down on me when I will die, so I donated my books. That's the first day, um, first announcement. In fact, that's the only announcement. And now let's move to the Shrangama Sutra. In order to liberate all sentient beings, let's say, uh, make aspiration for bodhicitta. And whenever you're listening to the Dharma, I think it is the best to, to also maintain such a kind of aspiration and listen properly and attentively. We've finished the prologue, or rather the causes of the teaching of the Shrangama Sutra of the Buddha. And the story goes as um, the it goes uh, as that um, um, uh, Matangi woman fell in love with Ananda, and uh, through the Matangi woman's mother's mantra, Ananda uh, got dazed, and then it was at the time that Ananda was about to break his vow, Buddha. Uh, Illuminated, uh, illuminated lights and uh, 
numinous penetration, and that time the mantra was broke, and、uh, Manjushri went there to bring Ananda and Madhangi woman together to the Buddha. So that's the cause for this teaching of the sutra. Many people, in fact, they didn't really understand too much about the sutra, and、um, then they started、uh, making slandering of the sutra and、uh, accused the sutra be,、uh, by saying that the sutra is a false sutra. It is not the sutra that is taught by the Buddha. And one of the reasons is that、uh, they said that、uh, it is not possible. This story is not the same as. The other sutras, the format is different. Or the Ananda at that time, he should have been in summer retreat. Why would he go there? Go to other places. And the third reason they would give is that Ananda is the one who had attained the first level of realization of、uh, the Taravada practitioners. How could he then get?、Uh, Get fooled by such a mantra and get controlled by this mantra. But the way they describe this, also,、uh, they would say that a Matangi woman uh, is uh, not really included in the、uh, in the sutra tradition. But that's not really true.、Uh, lots of their slandering sometimes is, in fact, the majority of times. Are out of reason, are also very illogical, and sometimes their language is not even polite when they slander and attack such sutra. So to answer their questions and doubts about this sutra,、uh, some people would answer that in fact、uh, Ananda went out on the last day of the summer retreat, and、uh, that's the. That's the last day.、Uh, therefore, on that day, in fact, all the precepts of staying in the summer retreat has already then stopped. Therefore, on that day, Ananda is free to go out. And Ananda has, and the second reason is that Ananda had、uh, already attained the first、uh, level of、uh, realization of the Taravada tradition, and then it is said, in fact. The mantra. In fact, the mantra is stated that、um, it could make control of everyone, but the Buddha,、uh, but the fully enlightened one. So obviously, he had not a,、uh, attained the fully enlightenment. He still has residues of desire. And the third reason that. Matangi woman, the Matangi's daughter, in fact, there are sutras which included her.、Uh, there are sutras、um, that is taught、uh, to her. That is.、Um, uh, Buddha's uh, uh, teaching to the Mat Matangi woman. That's the title of the sutra. And it was translated into Chinese and、uh, translated by An Gao, Ji Qian, Fa Hu, and all of these great translators had already translated the sutra. And the teaching, the story that is taught in that sutra, is very similar to the sutra、uh, to the story that is taught in the Shrangama Sutra, except that in different translations, some of them are more elaborate and some of them are a little bit more con. Condensed, and in the Tibetan tradition, in the Tibetan language edition, it is then stated as、uh, translated as the Tiger's Ear Sutra. In fact, the Tiger's Ear Sutra is translated from Sanskrit. I also then compared, made a comparison of uh, uh, the Tiger's Ear Sutra with the. Buddha's teaching to the Matangi's Matangi's Matangi woman's sutra. I think lots of them are very similar, except that 
Except that in the Tibetan version, that the mantra that is chanted by the Mutangi woman's mother, in fact, is much much more uh, expanded than the uh, than the ones that is included in the Chinese version. So the Chinese version is rather quite short. And Matangi, what is that? Uh, Matangi actually be belong. It, it describes a kind of gla class that um, uh, are the women who would uh, dance and uh, sing for uh, people so that they would get uh, entertained. So it's really singers and uh, dancers rather than prost uh, rather than prostitutes. And it is said that they are the beautiful women in lower caste. So she is a beautiful woman, but lives and born, and she was born in a low class. And there are also people who would slander the Matangi, the the sutra that is taught to the Matangi woman, uh, to say that is also a false sutra because the because Shurangama sutra is false. This is quite absurd because they had not ever read into or studied into uh, the his, historical background or read into many different editions. They would only read other people's uh, opinions, and they would read only uh, this sutra, and then based on their own conceptual thoughts and their de deluded view, they would just make a hasty conclusion by saying that, oh, Shurangama Sutra is false, and oh, this um, sutra that's taught to the Matangi woman is also false. In fact, I feel this kind of wrong view is really necessary uh, to be eradicated. And we should, other than this kind of uh, wrong views that is obviously, uh, uh, that obviously creates uh, lots of um, uh, distractions to Buddhism. Um, I think we should hold an open-mindedness, open-heartedness to the different commentaries and, ex and explanations written by great masters previously. Some masters in fact, uh, uh, they felt that the outlines that's written um, to the Shurangama Sutra, uh, in fact, uh, they feel that it's not necessary, it's not uh, useful, and so on. I feel that if you were to use outline, it's OK. If you don't have outline, it's OK, because in fact, I think sutras are rather very different than the shastras because it doesn't really follow the kind of shastras um, logic or the, the commentaries composed by the previous great masters. Um, the logic, at least, is uh, very different. Therefore, it's, um, I don't think it's very necessary to use an outline to explain the sutras. In Tibetan Buddhism, there are lots of debates. Uh, debates uh, that is um, uh, debates against uh, certain small matters, but they would use a long period of time to debate with one another. I think. Yes, you could do that. But on the other hand, when we look at this genuine sutra that is taught by the Buddha himself, and when there are people who would slander such a sutra, I think it would be very necessary for us to destruct, to eradicate such kind of a wrong view and wrong opinions. And by doing that, in fact, you are not making any mistakes. In the 
Madhyamika Vatara, it says that if you were to use the sword of wisdom to break the wrong views and the wrong ideas uh, that is taught by other sutras and shastra, in fact, it is uh, not. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, not creating any negative karma for yourself. So at the beginning, I really want to address that the importance of uh, the importance of uh, recognizing that this is the genuine sutra, and we should all know that um, at pro appropriate time and uh, at appropriate situation, we should eradicate their wrong ideas. This is quite necessary. So the actual teaching. In fact, now we've moved to the part where Ananda were was brought back to um, the Buddha. In order to save time, I think uh, the sutra is quite condensed, very concise, and sometimes it could be a little bit difficult to um, understand, but uh, it reminds me that Ponsoka Rinpoche, when he was given teachings of Vajrayana in the United States, he would then first give oral, oral uh, transmission, and then he said that I will give you some uh, short uh, comments, commentaries. And then he explained it to the Westerners, uh, saying that, in fact, the first one is the the oral transmission, and uh, the second part I give you, although it sounds very similar, it is the explanation. Uh, it both has different kinds of powers, and I hope that you do not get uh, tired and bored by listening. I myself, however, is a little bit different when it comes to Shurangama Sutra because I don't have the uh, because I don't have the uh, leaning the oral transmission. I tried to look for the oral transmissions uh, from others, but uh, the people who uh, contacted me, I don't think they necessarily have the oral transmission all the way from Zhang Jia Master. Therefore, uh, maybe I will have to postpone the oral transmission all the way to the chapter 9 or so. Anyhow, at that time, uh, then at that time, Ananda uh, came to the Buddha, and when he saw the Buddha, he prostrated to him at his foot, at his feet, and weeping bitterly, and saying that since the time without beginning, though he had heard much about the Dharma, he still could not acquire the transcendent power of uh, the Dharma. Uh, in fact. According to the uh, sutra taught to the Matangi woman, the whole story was more explained. Uh, for example, how Matangi uh, met Ananda at the river bank and offered water to Ananda, and then Matangi told his mother, uh, told her mother by saying that uh, she wanted to marry uh, Ananda, she felt she fell in love with Ananda, and so on. All of these kind of stories were were ascribed in that sutra. So he, at that time, didn't really feel um, hatreds or feel uh, aversion towards the Matangi woman. Rather, what he felt was that he, f he felt really, re really regret that um, he had not, although he had been um, he had not yet perfected his strength in the way to of uh, eradication. And in fact, there was a story of Ananda and the Buddha in the previous in the previous life of Ananda and the Buddha. Both of them made the aspiration for Anuddha somebody in front of uh, uh, an ancient Buddha, and then at that time, uh, the Buddha made the aspiration, and also he combined such aspiration with diligence. But Ananda enjoyed listening 
to the teaching more than practicing uh, with diligence, and therefore the Buddha attained Buddhahood first. So Siddhartha attained Buddhahood first. Therefore, Ananda, with such kind of habitual pattern of listening and studying, he listened. He is the foremost uh, in the Buddha's disciples in uh, studying and listening. But he didn't really practice uh, diligently. Therefore, his afflictions were not transformed into onto the path. And he then fell into a very dangerous situation that he almost broke his, his vow. So at that time, Ananda then bowed and wept and uh, also uh, confessed that he didn't really study, uh, he didn't really practice. So, yes, it's important to study and contemplate. But if you were to only grasp onto words, if you were to only grasp onto the literary meaning and not really connecting such kind of teaching with your life, whenever situations come up, whenever obstacles come up, whenever illness, death, and old age comes up, whenever all these kinds of enemies uh, come up, then you won't be able to work with them. So according to the great uh, Mahaparinirvana Sutra, it says that it is important to have uh, both samadhi and wisdom, just as uh, just like a pillar that is deep, deeply rooted in the ground. At first, you need to wiggle it so that it is loose, and then you can pull it out. So when you wiggle it, that is the power. By the power of your samadhi, or your meditative status, um, by your practice, and then when you pull it out, it is by the effort or the energy of uh, your of your wisdom. So without the power of without the power of samadhi, without the power of actual practice, it's going to be very difficult to apply wisdom later to pull out the pillar. Therefore, over here, Ananda is pointing out that he studied a lot, but he didn't really have time to apply such knowledge into his practice. And then he respectfully and repeatedly requested an explanation of the very first expedient of the wonderful shamatha, samapati, and dhyana, by means of which the Tathagatas of the Ten Directions had realized the Bodhi. So he said that so he said that if he were to practice, uh, he, if uh, so when he, so when he um, practiced, that he then know that there is the shamatha that is uh, peaceful abiding. Peace uh, abiding, and then uh, samapati is vipassana, and uh, dhyana is the combination of shamatha and uh, samapati. So this kind of teaching is the very first expedient teaching. Could you please give us this teaching? He then respectfully and repeatedly requested uh, the Buddha because he knows that this is the teaching given uh, by the Tathagatas, and this is the teaching that the Tathagatas of the Ten Directions had realized the Buddha. Uh, realize the body. In fact, according to Tiantai school, there are different kinds of uh, a detailed analysis of the shamatha and uh, samapati and dhyana practice. I'm not going to get into it too much, but they all have this kind of methods as well. And over here, he said that this expedient means of this teaching, he is, re he is requesting the Buddha
and uh, uh, he requested for the Dharma. So whenever some of our monastics goes out, lots of the lay practitioners would say that, uh, could you please give us some very expedient teaching? Could you give us a, a, the, the foundational teaching? Because I didn't really study it before. Could you please give me some teaching on the Madhyamika? Because it's very difficult for me to uh, study the middle way teachings. Could you please give me teachings like that? So, um, in fact, uh, there are different kind of requests like that. And uh, uh, despite that, the situation is an obstacle. He then created this uh, situation to request for the expedient teaching of the Dharma. Ananda was the attendant of the Buddha. And therefore, everyone felt that Buddha for sure will give the most expedient teaching to uh, uh, to Ananda. Therefore, the Bodhisattvas and Arhats and the Pratika Buddhas, as numerous as the sands of uh, Ganges, they all gathered from ten directions, as well as lay practitioners, bhikshus, bhikshunis, and uh, all of them, uh, as well as the celestial bees, uh, the nagas, the, rakshas, the uh, rakshasas, and so on. They're all uh, gathered over there. So the best shamatha, the best kind of a samapati, the best kind of dhyana, could you please give us teaching of this? That is the request. In uh, Shuragama Sutra, the Buddha, in fact, gave the teaching of uh, uh, the shamatha practice, the samadapati practice, and the union of uh, both. Therefore, this teaching could uh, bring enlightenment to, uh, uh, to different kinds of people. That is why all different types of people, the bodhisattvas, arhats, and uh, the celestial beings, as well as uh, the nagas, rakshasas, they all gathered around wanting to receive this uh, sagely instruction. At first, maybe people w were standing, some were standing, some were sitting, and some were doing different things. But when it was the time to listen to the Dharma, they withdrew silently to their seats because there's regulations when you listen to the teachings. And they were listening to the Dharma just as how the ill ones are seeking for the good medicine and how the hungry and thirsty ones are seeking for food and drinks. That's the way that they listen. They wanted to listen to the Dharma. That's their attitude. They have this joyous mind to listen to the Dharma. They have this full respect to listen to the Dharma. In fact, I think this is quite important to maintain this kind of demeanor when you're listening to the Dharma. This kind of regulation of listening to the Dharma is quite important to abide. We, in fact, talked about uh, uh, the five uh, not-to-dos and uh, all different kinds of regulations that's described in words of my perfect teacher. And this kind of regulations, the rules should be remembered and should be abide, uh, should be abide and uh, uh, uphold by those of you who listen to the Dharma. According to the Sutra on Upasaka precepts, it says that those who listen should be equipped with 16 qualities. And the first one is that listen always. It is saying that you should attend, you should be attentive when you uh, are listening to the Dharma. Uh, you should then come on time and do not uh, leave. And you should listen with delight and listen with intently. Uh, 
listen respectfully. Listen respectfully. In fact, this kind of respect towards your Vajra Sangha, towards your master. Some people don't have too much respect. In fact, this kind of lack of respect is really bad. And the Buddha said that if you don't have the respectful mind towards the teacher who's giving you the teaching of dar the Dharma, you're not creating negative karma. Even the Buddha would say that good, good, you're, you can leave. And the fifth one is listen without finding faults. Fifth, sixth one is listen without seeking a debate. Seventh, listen without seeking to surpass the speaker. Eighth, listen without belittling the speaker. And the ninth one is listen without belittling the Dharma. Some people would. Some people want to belittle the Dharma, but they don't have the ability. Therefore, they want to listen first. And with such intention, this is not the best to listen to the Dharma. And the tenth one, listen without belitt belittling yourself. There are a lot of people who would say that I, there's no way that I will be able to understand the Dharma. There's no way I can practice the Dharma. I'm too lazy. I'm too foolish. Uh, I'm not of the high capacity. Therefore, it is the best for me not to listen to the Dharma. So do not hold such kind of a feeling to Towards yourself, do not belittle yourself. We should, in fact, listen with a joyful mind, listen with delight, and accept the teaching of the Tathagata. I think. The English version is okay, but the Chinese version needs to. Uh, the Chinese version that we used, in fact, is based on a version that they made some tweaking and changing of the sutra. Therefore, they need to make some uh, adjustment. So um, the order that he changed is that he tr he changed the part where it says that the, the Buddha used his golden arm to uh, touch the crown of the uh, touch the crown of Ananda to put it over here in this part. This is changed by Master Yuan Ying, and he didn't really have a very steady. Uh, very um, important logic or reasoning. Therefore, only Master Xuanhua as well as Master Yuan Ying made such changes, not to anyone else. So, in fact, the, the translation that we're using now, the English version we're using now is fine. We don't have to make any changes because it is uh, in accord uh, in terms of the order of uh, this part of the passage with uh, the Tibetan language version. At first, when we when I give the teaching of the Lotus Sutra, I then change the order of uh, some of the Lotus Sutra passages according to the Tibetan version. Uh, and uh, lots of people uh, went against of me at that time, and I changed it back. So now let's look at how Master Yan Ying, in fact, you in fact change this part, uh, a passage to here without much of the evidence or uh, Sanskrit version as a base. But uh, uh, no one really went against of him. Well, <laughs> it's. However, I feel it's rather unnecessary to make the change of the order of the the sutra. I stated before, in fact, including the Tibetan version, the English version, and uh, other versions. In fact, they listed. Uh, 
with this order and will follow this order instead of uh, the version that is printed and uh, we're using right now. And Master Xuanhua, I think he said that it is uh, then more it feels more smooth when such when that passage is moved to this part but there's no other reasoning other than that previously it is already said that Ananda requested for the teaching of the Dharma from the Tathagata and all the Bodhisattvas and uh, Arhats and uh, particular Buddhas all came and uh, surrounded the Buddha and uh, sat down and listened to the Dharma. And th at that time, in fact, I think this is quite it could be very similarly, it could be very good to uh, continue the, the, the text without uh, touching Ananda's crown. The previous part, I think, the Shrangama Sutra has a, a slightly different order, and then later on it follows a different logic. Therefore, we will just follow the previous master's commentary and their way of uh, of using this text. So over here it says that then the, Buddha, uh, then the Buddha said to Ananda, you and I are close relatives. We're like brothers. Close relatives. In fact, it means that they are uh, close, rela uh, close relatives. See, over here, it means that uh, they are um, their brother, uh, their cousin brothers. Some masters explain quite a bit about what close relatives are. In fact, in the Tibetan version, it's rather quite simple. It says that Yun and I are close relatives. We are cousin brothers. Tell me what you saw in the assembly when you made up your mind to give up all worldly feelings of affection and love to follow me. So why don't you tell me directly, why don't we have this chat? Tell me how you felt at that time when you made your mind to get ordained and follow me. What is it that you saw so that you made up your mind to give up all worldly feelings? And right away you give up all the worldly feelings and affections and love, including your parents, your relatives, your uh, brothers, and the, your status, your wealth, and all of these. What is it that made you to give up, to follow me? Just as how some parents, once they get to know that uh, their children want to get ordained, they feel that, why do you want to get ordained? Why is it that you want to make such a decision? What can you gain from it? In fact, I think you know, um, Ananda was born uh, at the time when Buddha got enlightened. And when Ananda was still very young, very little, and he started to follow the Buddha and got ordained already, he was one of the earliest ones, I think, but it was not really very obvious in the history record. But uh, it is uh, recorded in a story that um, uh, Shudodana at once, when Shudodana was then having a party with his relatives, and he said that my prince Siddhartha, if he were not uh, ordained and become a monastic, he would have been a universal monarch. But he got ordained now and had already attained enlightenment and attained Buddhahood. 
But all the people around him, all the great enlightened ones that's around him now, they're all Brahmins. But he is a Shakya. He is of a Shakya lineage, and she is, she is of a Shakya clan. And those of you who are attending this party, you are all of Shakyas. Don't you think you should also join the uh, join the uh, uh, the Buddha and follow him? At that time, after Shuddhadana's. Uh, speech: Five hundred prince and and uh, people all then got ordained. Maybe Devadatta got ordained at that time as well. I have no idea why he got ordained, but uh, that was part of the historical hist uh, his uh, part of the historical uh, story of uh, Shuddhadana. And he said that, in fact, uh, at that time, lots of Brahmin were following the Buddha, but why not we? So uh, the Buddha then asked Ananda, saying that, so what is it that you saw? What is it that um, attracted you to get ordained and follow me? And then Ananda replied, saying that I saw the 32 excellent characteristics and shining crystal-like form of the Buddha's body. Ananda, he grasped onto the form a lot. There are people who, there are people who got ordained because they feel that, wow, monastics uh, with the robes are really beautiful. Therefore, they got ordained. And there are people who feel that, well, monastics live a simple life. Therefore, I want to get ordained. And there are people who want to get ordained because they felt that the uh, monastics could then get closer to liberation. Therefore, they get ordained. When I got ordained, I felt that the monastics are really pure. And the way that the monastics dress the lamas can wear a really beautiful yellow, uh, the yellow robe, and I felt that wow, the monastics can wear the color yellow. That's a beautiful yellow. And I went to the county and uh, I bought this yellow, uh, this yellow colored uh, clothing. <laughs> And uh, I asked, I asked uh, uh, Kempo Deba at that time whether I can wear it. And uh, another Kempo, he said, uh, Lamarika, uh, Lamarika said that no, don't wear that. Otherwise, the people would feel that you're almost like a toku, uh, and uh, they would feel that uh, you are, you're, <laughs> and uh, people would laugh at you because you're newly ordained as well. And uh, Lama Deba then lent me a. A, a shirt at that time, and uh, his shirts are rather quite dirty. And uh, he said that, no, don't mind about such dirt because you look like an, an old practitioner. This is very good. <laughs> so some people, some people really are attracted to the forms. And the Buddha has this 32 characteristics, as well as the form, and the form of uh, the Buddha's body is crystal-like. It's really beautiful. According to Nagarjuna's precious garland, it says that all universal emperors are regarded as having these marks, but their purity, beauty, and luster cannot match even a bit those of a Buddha. Their body is pure, is beautiful, and is not tinted even a bit, just like crystal. And then at that time, uh, Ananda then replied, saying that I thought that all these could not be a result of desire and love. It cannot be the result of such. 
Why is that? Because desire creates foul and fetid impurities like pus and blood, which mingle and cannot produce the wondrous brightness of his golden hued body. This impure uh, body that uh, we have, in fact, the Buddha's body cannot be the cannot be the result of uh, the same way that we received this body. And it is said that the best kind of gold on this uh, Jambu Vipa cannot compare to the uh, Kashyap cannot compare to the color and uh, the body of Kashyapa, but Kashyapa's body cannot compare even a bit to the Buddha's body. In fact, Ananda's, um, Ananda's ordination is not really based on his aspiration of gaining liberation. Rather, his inspiration is that uh, he saw this beautiful characteristic of the Buddha. And just like how people nowadays, they would feel that, oh, it is the best of not having any hair. It is the best to shave off my hair so that I don't have to wash it. It is the best to wear this beautiful maroon colored robes. That's why I want to get uh, ordained. I, I feel this is rather um, not a, a good way of, uh, a good inspiration to be ordained. In fact, ordination is Ordination is a choice that should be made by a minority of people who then are ready to take up the responsibilities of the society, of the world, of the sentient beings, of the family, and of many different kind of areas. Otherwise, if you're not ready to take up this kind of responsibilities, you may feel regret. So, Ananda said that uh, because I have such admiration of uh, your beautiful body, I shave off my head to follow him, to follow the Buddha. And then Ananda under answered in such a, a concise way, so to speak, uh, saying that, uh, uh, in fact, I. In fact, I feel that you look beautiful, therefore I got ordained. In summary, <laughs> very short. <laughs> In fact, Ananda uh, was right on one point that uh, the Buddha's body was not the result of desire and the love because desire creates foul and fetid impurities like pus and blood. In uh, in a sutra, it says that it seems that in the uh, in the sutra, it described that uh, it may seem like it is the Queen Maya and uh, the King uh, Shuruddhana gave birth to the Buddha, but the story behind the conception of the Buddha was that he. In fact, um, his mother uphold the eight precepts, the Pakti Uposata precepts at that night and on that day and during that day. And at night, she dreamt of an elephant that has six tusks and enters her womb. And from uh, from her right arm, under her right arm, the Buddha entered into the womb of the mother. 
So it is not in the um, in the format or in the way that is like the mundane beings or how mundane beings get conceived. According to the fifth patriarch, he said that. Uh, in fact, the fifth patriarch could be called a son of no father. When the fourth patriarch was giving the teaching, there was an old monk who requested Dharma teaching from the fourth patriarch. And fourth patriarch saw that this old monk is very diligent, but at the same time really old. And the fourth patriarch said that, I don't want to give you teaching, because even if you can listen to it, you won't be able to propagate this dharma. Why don't I uh, wait for you to come back into this world, and then I'll give you the teaching? I think that old monk must be a very um, enlightened, an enlightened master. Otherwise, it will be difficult for him to chose the time of death. So old monk uh, agreed, and he then went down the hill and uh, uh, and saw a woman, and uh, he said that can I borrow your place to live for a night? And uh, after he went to her home, he died in her home, and at that night he entered into womb of the bo of the the woman. And she was pregnant. She was pregnant, and uh, the the parents of that woman felt it was such a disgrace that she got pregnant, and uh, they abandoned her. The woman was extremely upset and very depressed. On one hand, she felt that why it was her to be pregnant without even uh, without even. Uh, having a father for this child, and then she wanted to abandon this child, and she threw this newborn baby into the river. But at that time, not only the baby didn't die, uh, the water carried the baby upwards instead of downwards. So the woman, upon seeing this kind of scene, she picked up the baby and they begged and uh, uh, kept living through such a kind of begging. And uh, once they went to the area of the fourth patriarch, the fourth patriarch told the mother that you should let your boy to get uh, uh, ordained, and he did. And that's the story of the fifth patriarch. In fact, uh, Garab Dorji from the Tibetan tradition and many great masters also were conceived in such a way. Lots of masters, lots of the great masters who came back into this world by their aspiration and not by their karma, they came into this world in such a way. I'm sure lots of uh, um, Lots of uh, biology scientists, uh, lots of uh, the, uh, lots of the uh, medical uh, staff or doctors, they won't agree with this kind of conception at all. Uh, they may feel this is not possible, but the scientists and doctors they can only explain certain parts and certain aspect of the common situation, but not all situation. We do agree that there is the certain rule of how ma majority of people uh, were conceived and uh, were born, but different kinds of. But there are uh, there are special cases that really break our common uh, knowledge. And whenever people hear such kind of special cases, they would right away refuse to believe in them. They would think that, no, this is not possible. I do not agree. I do not think so. They come to very hasty conclusions. There are rules, and there are the ones that do not really. There are the kind of cases that are not exactly uh, following such kind of rules. 
Some of the causes and conditions are special. Therefore, we should not use only one mold to require, require all of the situations to be the same. The next part, in fact, is quite important. The Buddha said to Ananda, saying that, good, Ananda, he said, very well. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, after Ananda said that, you look so beautiful, and then the Buddha said that, yes, you're right. <laughs> he said, uh, very good, Ananda. You should all know that all living beings are continually born and continually die. This kind of mental continuity, we continuously to born and die. Simply because they do not know the everlasting true mind. Over here, the everlasting true mind over here is, uh, uh, is like the primordial awareness. So this kind of mind is bright substance of the pure nature. Instead, they engage in false thinking. They engage in dualistic thinking. And it has been so since the time without beginning. Their thoughts are not true. And so the wheel keeps turning. In fact, this passage is extremely important. Lots of masters would agree that this passage gives the teaching of direct pointing out of the nature of mind. So the sentient beings, all the way from the beginningless um, samsara, they do not recognize such kind of luminous and such a kind of pure nature. And whenever you recognize it, you can then uh, be enlightened. In the history, there was a master, his master Chan, uh, uh, Zen master, Po Shan. He generated the mind of renunciation when his parents died. And then after he read some of the master's teachings, he got ordained. And once he listened to the teaching of Shuangama Sutra in front of a monk, and when he heard the teaching of uh, this passage, at that time, he had a great doubts. In Tibetan Buddhism, we say that it is a kind of insights because it brings a great, uh, it brings a great uh, blessings. It's almost uh, similar to the koan that is given in Zen Buddhism. He was from Sichuan province, and then he went to different places and practice in uh, Huangmei, in a, a monastery, I think either fourth or fifth patriarch. At that time, he went through great hardship. He didn't have uh, food, he didn't have clothing. Sometimes he had to dig out uh, the uh, he had to dig out uh, wild uh, grass to eat and so on. And then at that time, he continuously to meditate for seven days. And uh, once during his, uh, during his uh, meditative walk, he fell off the cliff. And his leg was in great pain at that time. And at that moment, he then gained enlightenment. So sometimes it's good to experience pain and illness. Just like um, Master Po Shan, when he's experiencing the extraordinary pain at that moment, he attained enlightenment. Mm -hmm. 
After he attained enlightenment, he continuously to give the teaching of the Dharma, and his propagation of the Dharma was in fact quite, uh, quite successful. There was a bandit at that time. He killed many people. He killed uh, even millions of people. He was extremely cruel. And this master, he courageously went up to the bandit. This bandit was very cruel and he killed many people. Uh, at that time, uh, this bandit killed. Uh, may, uh, this bandit then killed lots of people in the city of Chengdu, and there was a valley. Even that valley is named as the Seven Families Valley, because at that time, the whole valley's people was killed. Only seven families was uh, uh, was alive, was stayed alive at that time. So Master Po Shan then went to such kind of bandit and uh, requested him not to kill the people over there. And uh, the bandit uh, requested him to eat meat. He said that I won't kill if you don't, if I won't kill if you eat meat. And right away, Master Po Shan asked the other people to bring raw meat to him and he ate several plates of it. So we can see that he is a quite a great bodhisattva, uh, and his action saved many people at that time, because the bandit was very touched by the action of the monk, and uh, uh, he released all the people that he were about to kill. In fact, just like Uta Tantra Shastra and the Vajrayana teachings, this passage talks about everyone has such Tathagata Garba. It is then pure and it is bright, it is luminous, and all such beings has it, and all everyone has the potential to be enlightened. Uh, the meaning is such, it is really up to you see, to see whether you can uh, get enlightened based on this passage. Now, if you wish to study and the unsurpassed Supreme Bodhi to realize in this bright nature, you should answer my questions with straightforwardness. So at that time, the Buddha started asking questions around Madan Ananda. Over here, straightforwardness of the mind. Why is that? Because he said that all Buddhas in the ten directions trod the same path to escape from birth and death because of their straightforward mind. With the same straightforwardness of mind and speech from start to finish without a trace of crookedness. Over here, this is straightforwardness. Uh, sometimes it is translated in the Tibetan Tripitaka as the Madhyamika, as middle way. And Madhyamika, there are two types, the mind Madhyamika and the speech Madhyamika. And once you can have such kind of uh, straightforwardness or straightforwardness or this kind of straight. Um, straightforward mind. It is like. Great masters always uh, mention that there are three types of uh, important minds. Uh, last year, during the Vimala Kriti Sutra, we also talked about uh, how uh, the straightforward mind is um, the practice place. In fact, a straightforward mind um, or the Madhyamika, as, uh, Madhyamika mind, a middle way mind, that is devoid of all the extremes and so on, the, it could work as well. What is the straightforwardness of speech then? It is 
understanding the ultimate meaning completely, that is the straightforwardness of speech. And what is the straightforwardness of mind? It is a understanding the three truths are uh, permanent, and then this is the straightforwardness of mind as it is taught in the Tiantai school, from the Tiantai school's aspect. So the Buddha said that now you see that the Buddhas of the Ten Directions, upon relying on the Prajna Paramita, they received their, or they attained body, they attained enlightenment. And within this, they are without any kinds of uh, crookedness, and uh, they are devoid of all kinds of extremes. And then Buddha asked Ananda, so now I'm going to ask you the question now. Ananda, when you develop that mind because of the Buddha's 32 excellent characteristics, tell me what saw and loved them. What is it that you used to see it? And upon seeing these 32 characteristics, you said you're very joyful. So who or what is joyful? It's a very simple question. I think uh, the mundane people also would ask in such a way. And then Ananda replied, saying that a world-honored one, my love came from the use of my mind. My joy came from the use of my mind. And my eyes seeing and my mind admiring them, so that it was set on relinquishing birth and death. So Ananda said, I use my eyes to see your body and to see your 32 characteristics, and then my mind admired them. And my mind made the aspiration to uh, also attain such kind of body that is uh, uh, full of the 32 characteristics. And then the Buddha told Ananda, saying that, as you just said, your love was, was caused by your mind and eyes. But if you do not know where your mind and eyes really are, you will never be able to destroy delusion. So from here, the Buddha really want to help the uh, the help Ananda to uh, find where or what the mind and eyes really are. At first, Ananda is uh, tortured by uh, Matangi woman, and uh, now he is tortured by the question of the Buddha's question. So it says that if you don't know where your mind and eyes really are, if you don't know, even know that, then how could you destroy delusions? How could you um, how could you subjugate your afflictions? If you do not understand where your mind and eyes are, then there's no way to subjugate all the afflictions and delusions. Just as when a king is bothered by bandits and the country is invaded by them, and the king, before sending his soldiers to, to destroy them, the king should then first know where they are. If you do not know where the army is or the bandit is, the bandits are, then you would uh, search or fight for the band to the bandits at, uh, at uh, different directions. It is uh, taught talked quite a bit in the uh, autobiography uh, in the biography of King Gesar. So, where is your mind and eyes? Ananda said, this is easy, I can understand it. 
And then Ananda replied, "World honored one, all living beings born in the world through the ten types of birth, hold that this knowing mind is in the body. All the kinds of body, all the kinds of uh, uh, sentient beings, including the ones that are born from womb, from eggs, from moisture, and born by transformations, and those with thoughts, and those." Uh, Without forms, in fact,、uh, there are two kinds that's omitted from the ten, from the twelve kinds of living beings. The beings of the three realms, the beings from the realm of desire, realm of、uh, form, realm of formlessness. But there are two kinds. Uh, without form, are the kind without thought are omitted. Even in the bardo body, even、uh, the even、uh, consciousness that's、uh, still in the bardo experience, they can enter into different body and then、uh, uphold the body. That's how they feel. So it's inside the body. And then Ananda said with soft voice, saying that. Ananda's eyes is.、Um, I see that they're on the face, just like the lotus blue eyes of the Buddha. I see they are on his face. It's my understanding that my eyes are on my face, whereas my knowing mind is in my body. There are different kinds of explanations based on that.、Um, only saying that my saying that my eyes are on my face. In fact, it is then stated that the elements,、uh, form, smell, taste, and the touch, are then. On my are on my face. On according to the Tibetan version, it says that the four pure faculties are then、uh, the four faculties that could perceive are on the face. According to Abhidharma, it is said that the elements, their form, smell, taste, and touch, but it doesn't it doesn't include sound, because、um, according to Abhidharma, the sound doesn't have a continuity, doesn't have a characteristic of continuity. Therefore, it is not included. Other than that, the form and smell and taste and touch, such kind of four elements are then included. Later on, we'll talk more in detail about those. So, the four kinds of elements, or four kinds of defiling objects, are on my face. So there are the four elements of my eyes, of my nose. In fact, all the faculties include these four elements. And Ananda replied in this way, saying that, saying that the four, the four defiled,、um, the four defiled objects are on my face, and whereas you, the world honored one, your blue lotus flower eyes are on your face. He's very good, very eloquent, isn't he? And so too, my conscious mind actually is within my body. The way Ananda、uh, answered to the Buddha is quite straightforward,、uh, according to how he felt. Just like how mundane people would feel, isn't it? This is the question and answer between the Tathagata and Ananda, and we will stop here. And、uh, later on, the Buddha will continue continue to、uh, analyze this、uh, for Ananda, and we will continue this next class. <laughs>